Uh, hi everyone. Good evening. My name is Rubina, and I am a PhD student at the Indian Institute of Public Health, Public Health Foundation of India, and uh, I work in the area of cardiovascular epidemiology. And my topic is: Do cholesterol lowering drugs have an effect on our cognitive abilities? I will be uh, breaking this down in the coming slides. But before I tell you the what, how, where, and when of my PhD work, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the why. I'm sure we all know somebody uh, with a heart ailment. My father's uncle was one such heart patient I knew. He visited us every year, and his travel bag always had a cute little pill box that fascinated me. And I once asked him what all those pills were for, and then he told me about his heart disease. So since then, every time we met, we discussed these things. This consistently piqued the curiosity of the science geek in me and got me interested in cardiovascular diseases. Now, during my master's in clinical research, I took my first lesson in epidemiology, which is a term we now hear almost every day since the COVID-19 pandemic. So, it's the study of people, the study of disease patterns and their risk factors in populations. So, if I say that the COVID test positivity rate in Delhi is around 20%, we know this because of epidemiology. So epi soon became my favorite subject, and I decided to design an epidemiological study for my master's thesis. And around the same time, my father suffered a minor heart attack and underwent surgical treatment. Post which he was put on cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins, which was also one of the component of that pill box. Now this caught my attention, and that's how I got into cardiovascular epidemiology. Now to understand what statins do, let me first explain a little bit about heart disease. So imagine an old water pipe that is clogged due to buildup of minerals and impurities along the interior walls over time. To put it simply, this is what happens to the arteries during heart disease, and this blockage is a consequence of the artery walls getting lined with plaque made up of cholesterol and triglycerides caused by an unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, smoking, alcoholism, or genetics. Now this plaque impedes blood flow and could lead to heart attacks. This is where statins come in. They can lower the cholesterol and reduce the risk of cardiac events by sixty percent by essentially inhibiting the production of cholesterol in our body. So all those suffering from and at risk of heart disease are thus put on statins. It's well established now that statins are highly effective and widely prescribed. However, just like any other drug, they have a few risks. So a few months after he started his medication, my father complained of some pain in his arms and legs. I did some research and I found that muscle pain is the most common adverse effects of statins, and people experience nerve problems, increased blood sugar, and cognitive issues as well. But the problem is that there aren't enough Indian studies on the statin side effects. Now you might ask why that is a concern. Well, that's because Asian Indians have unique lipid patterns, a unique drug metabolism, and our genetic makeup itself puts us at a higher risk of cardiac diseases. So we need more local studies to understand our population better. My master's thesis was on assessing the prevalence of muscle ailments among statin users, which came out to be around twenty-five percent. But I also found a twenty percent prevalence of memory loss in my patients, which wasn't even my primary objective. But it gave me my PhD research idea. Now I was intrigued by this finding since I couldn't find much literature on statins and cognition from India, and even the Western literature was conflicting. Now here's where things got interesting. In 2012, the US FDA introduced warnings for possible statin-induced memory loss on all statin drug labels. But we have research to show how prolonged statin use can impair as well as improve cognition. While some studies say that statins don't affect cognition at all, <laughs> and we have biological mechanisms to explain all of these opposing actions too. Fascinating, right? I'm trying to address a little bit of this ambiguity through my doctoral work. So this is my research question: What is the change in the cognitive status of adult statin users over a time period of two years? Now we come to the what, how, where, and when. So I have designed a longitudinal cohort, a longitudinal study, which means I'm following statin users for two years in time. If I start today, I follow them till two years from now, while measuring their cognitive levels at defined time intervals during this period. So at baseline in the beginning, then end of year one, end of year two, and at the end, I will assess a change in their cognitive scores and explore factors associated with this change. 
Now, I'm recruiting patients visiting the outpatient cardiology department at Savdajung Hospital. And these are people recently diagnosed with high cholesterol and thus put on statins in the last one year. I'm using the WHO STEPS questionnaire to collect social demographics and disease history data of the patients. And I'm administering a validated and universally used tool called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Scale to measure cognitive status and assign scores, for which I've obtained training and certification. Now, MOCA assesses various cognitive domains like visuospatial, naming, memory, attention, language, abstraction, delayed recall, and orientation abilities based on which we assign a score to each individual. And I've incorporated some participant retention strategies also so that I don't lose a lot of people over the last over the two years. Uh, some of them being explaining my study objectives at the beginning very clearly, obtaining contact information of a family member or friend so that I have more ways of reaching out, checking in with the participants once in a while and being available in case they have any questions regarding their health or even if they need COVID-19 related information. Now, I designed my proposal pre-pandemic and I had planned for an in-person data collection. But COVID-19, the lockdowns and restrictions, they threw everything off track. My work got delayed by a year. And considering uh, this challenging situation, my mentors and I decided to shift my data collection mode to telephonic. So I planned that I would sit in the OPD and recruit patients, but to avoid the risk of transmission, I would take cognitive testing over the phone. But it wasn't as simple as it sounded, because as it turned out, the telephonic version of MOCA was only available in English, while my population is primarily Hindi speaking. So I had to prepare two telephonic versions of the MOCA in Hindi for literate and illiterate people for remote testing in my study. And I'm happy to share that they are now available for use on the MOCA website. My journey so far has been quite a roller coaster ride, but I've learned from each obstacle. Cliche, but true. I've witnessed some major challenges associated with research in countries with limited resources like ours, be it a very skewed doctor-patient ratio, inequalities in healthcare access, or lack of well-maintained medical databases for patient records. My data collection has taught me the importance of establishing relationships with participants, listening to their concerns, and not just thinking of them as a source for data. I've also realized that a significant proportion of Indian patients are largely unaware about their disease and caregivers play a crucial role in helping them making sense of things. They are also our link to the participants. Like in my study, it's mostly the caregivers who've helped me communicate with the patients and convince them to talk to me. This has also given me many opportunities to practice science communication in my work, explaining things to my patients simplistically, which encourages them to participate fully. Now, I started my data collection in January 2021, and I've completed my baseline assessment of 250 participants, and I'll be following them up this year and the next, and I'm looking forward to gaining some novel insights into this under-researched area in a population and setting like ours. I know that my work cannot immediately benefit these patients. However, it's a modest yet meaningful first step in understanding the statins cognition relationship in Indians. This could foster new ideas, provide hypotheses for larger studies. My results can contribute to the knowledge pool that assists clinicians in making an informed decision for individualized treatment, all the while keeping the risk benefit ratio of statins in mind. The ultimate aim here is to foster a more holistic understanding of statins, which can help enhance the therapeutic experience of patients. I have quite a few people to thank, beginning from my uh, doctoral advisory committee, supervisor, co-supervisors, the patients and their uh, caregivers, without whom nothing will be possible, the very supportive staff at the cardiology department at Savdajam, the wonderful team, Shruti, Abhishek, and the others at ISF, my ISF mentor, Shashank, for all his meaningful inputs, uh, friends and colleagues, Ipsa and Mr. Shomikre, for allowing me to bounce my ideas off of them, and uh, Sarina, my sister, the design ninja, who has literally helped me put all of this together, both for the video and this presentation. Um, these are a few publications that I have in this area, and I hope to keep adding to this list and continue to contribute my bit to uh, research in this area. Uh, thank you for being a wonderful audience, and thank you for giving me this platform to talk about my work and to share what I'm doing. Thank you so much.